Okay, we're live. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the virtual jug. And uh, today we're going to be uh, talking about hibernating in the summer. And uh, and joining me today, uh, we have uh, Vlad. How are you doing, Vlad? Hello, I'm doing fine. Awesome. This is your this is your first V jug session, right? Yes, it is. Well, welcome to the virtual jug, and Vlad. If anyone's best place to talk about Hibernate, it's uh, it's of course Vlad. So we're gonna we'll introduce you in just a second. Uh, I'll just quickly say hey to Oleg as well. How are you doing, Oleg? Hey, people, doing great. Good to see you're uh, still alive, given your current uh, ill that you've got. Don't spoil, don't spoil my condition to the uh, internet. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> Uh, I'm actually doing pretty great. Remember the survey that we ran? I peaked mm -hmm. the responses, uh, mm -hmm. the Rebel Labs developer productivity survey about why do you use the tools you use? Yeah. And I'm super excited about the results. It just, it sh the report will show some trends and the data looks interesting. We're just trying to finalize that with. We're losing all of you. You're breaking up, Oleg. I think this is maybe spend a couple of minutes uh, and take that. I think I'm, I'm, am I online? You am I not? You're breaking up. Yeah, really good. You. good now. I, okay, yeah. I saw Vlad's smile frozen in the corner of the screen. And I was like, either I am talking nonsense or I'm breaking up. Anyway, I'm <laughs> on pills, so I should stop talking. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm doing okay. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. So let me uh, first of all introduce Vlad then. Uh, so uh, Vlad is uh, CEO of uh, High Persistence, which is an awesome name. Hyper, I, w I always want to say Hyper Persistence, but High Persistence. And, <laughs> and a developer advocate for, for Hibernate, um, as, well as, as well as being an awesome developer advocate and, um, and, and a, just a great advocate for Hibernate in general. Vlad is an amazing author, both blogs and uh, also a book. A high performance Java persistence, uh, which you can get from LeanPub as well. Um, I'm going to very quickly share my screen just to share some information about uh, about Vlad. Let me just do. Let me see if this is going to work. Here. Uh, I'm full screen, so I can see which one to share. It's that one. So, and then share screen. Screen. Go. Okay, so uh, we're going to be talking today about the session is going to be called High Performance Hibernate. And uh, our speaker, as I mentioned, is Vlad. You can follow Vlad on Twitter at Vlad uh, Mahelsia. Is that, is that yeah, that's, very, that's yeah. very difficult? Uh, it's Mihalcha. <laughs> Mihalcha. Oh, well, I was, I was close. Um, I'm yeah. used, people are used to listening to me bastardize names all over the place. So I, they're, they're used to that. No, no problem. So, yeah, follow Vlad on Twitter. Um, and uh, Vlad is very, very active on Twitter. Uh, the virtual jog is sponsored by Zero Turnaround, so feel free to uh, go to zeroturnaround.com uh, to look at some of the developer tooling that's available through there. Uh, if you wanted to interact with uh, Vlad or anyone else on the on the VJUG, you can do so via IRC. Uh, Pound Virtual Jug is the channel uh, on Freenode. Uh, you can access that through the widget on the Virtual Jug website next to the video. Uh, on the video, if you was to hit the cog, hit the little uh, the settings cog at the bottom right of that video, try and crank that up to the highest resolution you can, and it'll give you a best the best viewing experience possible. Also, please do share the group and session if you have colleagues that have never heard of the virtual jug, or if you have colleagues very interested in Hibernate or friends interested in Hibernate, please do share this session with them. And as always, any feedback about this session or the virtual jug in general, uh, you can either tweet the virtual jug handle or myself, we're always listening. So uh, with that, let me, uh, let me hand control over to Vlad. Uh, there we go. And uh, Vlad, please uh, inform us about how you can use Hibernate in a High performance way. One second to share my screen for. Yep. Okay. And while so, actually while Vlad's doing that, I'll just say any questions, please do ping them in IRC, and I'll uh, I have permission from Vlad to interrupt him during. So please do ping questions in IRC, and we'll uh, we'll we'll put them to Vlad straight away. Sure, that's great. Uh, you can see the screen, right? Yeah, we can see. Okay, so now I'm going to start. Uh, hello, everyone. 
as uh, I've been introduced already, my name is Vlami Halja. I work for Hibernate. I'm not just a developer advocate, I'm also a developer. I uh, do bug fixing, in, uh, integrate pull requests, uh, and also develop new new features as, as well, mostly around the uh, database performance. That's uh, always a uh, top priority for, for me. You can find on my blog, uh, lamihalcha.com, uh, an extensive list of uh, articles about uh, Hibernate JPA, but also uh, things like uh, NoSQL, NewSQL, and transactions, ACID. Uh, that's my Twitter ID and uh, my GitHub profile. Also, this uh, presentation is uh, very much based on the second part of my book, which is called High Performance Java Persistence, and which is also about not only Hibernate, but also JDBC and uh, Juke as well. Okay, for today, this is the agenda, what uh, I want to discuss. Uh, first, um, I want to tell you a little bit about what's performance and how we typically measure it. Afterwards, we are going to, to go through all sorts of topics which affect performance. Um, and uh, we are going to relate all of them to the response time. Um, first, the thing that um, uh, we need to we need to discuss is that uh, most application like application dynamics uh, has uh, realized uh, application dynamic um, is a tool which you can uh, monitor application performance and they realize that uh, half of the application performance bottlenecks originate in the database actually it's not just the database but more uh, the data access layer in general not just the database that's to blame but how you interact and how you access usually the database that's going, that can uh, become a, a problem. Now, why do you want to have performance uh, besides uh, having uh, a better user experience for your application? Uh, there are also things that uh, are not so apparent, like uh, for instance, Google, Google is going to take into consideration the site speed when it, uh, when it builds uh, the rank for, for various websites. So if you're on a field, if you have a startup and you have competition, you usually want to, to be, you usually want your site to be faster than your competitor so that your, uh, your site is going to, to be the first when people are going to search for whatever uh, is the field that you are operating uh, in. Now, um, there are also, that's uh, one thing also, um, this quote is actually very interesting because it allows you to see that performance actually has an impact also on business and for instance in this presentation from 2008 uh, amazon told that for every 100 milliseconds of uh, latency um, they get uh, one percent uh, less profit which is actually quite uh, significant so yes performance can actually uh, um, performance can actually affect businesses so the better we uh, the better application works actually uh, we might get even better revenue so now, uh, because we're talking about uh, data and data access layer, uh, everything revolves around transactions. And we can typically uh, measure response time uh, in various parts of our application. We can measure it at the browser level, at the web, level, uh, web layer level. But here, because we're talking about the data access layer, it's better to, to measure it at um, the service layer. For instance, when the transaction, from the moment the transaction starts until the transaction ends, and we can uh, release the database connection. So if we take a look on this diagram, you will see that uh, this is uh, what happens behind the scene in JDBC, no matter what data access uh, uh, framework you are going to use. First, you need a, data you need a database connection, and that might uh, take time. We can speed it up. Uh, you then need to get a statement or a prepared statement. That can also be optimized. Uh, you can you then uh, execute queries or statements. Of course, that's also can be optimized. And then you can traverse, navigate the result set, get the results. Usually, that's the part that uh, might take the most. Uh, um, that's usually the, uh, the the part that you can um, focus on from the very beginning. And also, one thing that people don't really think about it is that if you hold on to a connection and don't do anything related to a database and doing just application level processing, that might uh, hurt scalability because you don't release the connection and others might queue, uh, other concurrent um, 
request might queue up in order to wait for your connection to, to be available for them. OK, so if uh, based on that diagram, we can conclude that the response time at the transaction lev, uh, layer is built up of various segments, like the connection acquisition time, the time it takes to send all the statements to the database, then uh, the database has to execute them, and then the result set needs to be uh, marshaled from the database to the client, and you also get that idle time that I mentioned. So we are going to discuss and see how we can op optimize all of them. Now, uh, the connection is the first thing that uh, we can focus on. And if you take a look here, you'll see um, four different database systems, which if we measure how much time it takes to acquire physical connection, typically, if you want to acquire phys physical connection, you just have to use the driver, which always gives you um, connection to the database. It opens a socket. It establishes the TCP connection. And that takes time. And for instance, if you take the 99 percentile, you can see that it takes between 20, 10, 20 milliseconds uh, for some databases, even 50 milliseconds. And that's quite quite a lot because uh, if, for instance, it, if it takes you 50 milliseconds to, to acquire a connection, that means that at most you can have 20 transactions per second per, per connection, which is actually quite low. And for that, I, I haven't even included uh, the query execution time and uh, the fetching time. So um, on the other hand, if you are going to use a connection pool like Hikari, you can see that the time it takes to acquire a connection drops to 10 microseconds. So it's quite a significant improvement. And that's one thing that we're using. That's why we're using connection pool, is because we want to speed up the connection acquisition. And another advantage we get is that we can level up traffic spikes because we introduce a queue there. So we are not pushing all the traffic to the database, therefore buying us uh, a little bit of time. And if if you have a traffic spike, that's going to affect a service, but it's not going to affect the whole system. Now, when it comes to Hibernate, you have various options because Hibernate has its own uh, connection provider interface. Uh, which has many implementations, like uh, you can use the driver manager, data source, Hikari, or P3PO. And um, which one uh, is better than the other, we will see uh, in, in a minute. Um, although the C3PO and Hikari are quite nice, uh, the driver manager just uh, was meant only for testing, so that Hibernate core depends uh, only on Hibernate related and has fewer dependencies. Um, the best one to use is the data source connection provider because it allows it allows you to just um, it allows you to chain as many data sources as you want and from the application perspective this is quite transparent because the application only sees the data source and doesn't really need to know what's behind that so we can have a connection pool we can also use data source proxy which is also an open source project which allows you to to log uh, statements along with their um, bind uh, parameter values. And also, you can use FlexiPool to monitor um, connection acquisition. So usually, if you're using, either if you're using a resource local or a JDBC uh, transaction, or if you're using JTA uh, using the data service connection provider, uh, it's usually the best, uh, the best choice. Now, uh, we've seen that. Uh, Using a connection pool uh, is the way to go. However, if we have a system, something like that, which has uh, one master and multiple replicas, um, and then you have probably auto scaling for front end nodes, you have a batch process uh, application like for importing data, for synchronizing the full text uh, search engine, also one maybe batch processor that uh, send email campaigns. And all of those require connections to the database. And uh, now you have to think uh, how, what's the right size to give to a connection pool. And there are two ways you could do it. Either you can think about and try to, to do it uh, up front and try to provision it uh, with a mathematical formula, or you can um, use, a proactive, uh, um, use a proactive technique and just uh, monitor the application and adjust it, uh, adjust it accordingly. 
However, although there might be some uh, mathematical formulas like uh, Erlang formulas, which uh, work pretty well in telecommunication systems, in reality, uh, computer, computer and uh, enterprise application are way, way much more complex when it comes to uh, figuring out what would be the right pool size. So uh, that leaves us with the second approach we, where we can, the best way to, to know what's the right size for a given application is to just assign a value and then monitor it constantly because even data access patterns change from time to time. So uh, even an initial uh, size might not fit uh, six months from now. For that, uh, I built this project, which is called the uh, FlexiPool. It's open source. You can find it on GitHub. It has an Apache V2 license, and it supports uh, the major connection pools uh, you might find in Java, like Hikari, Tomcat, uh, DBCP. Uh, also, um, uh, it supports uh, the JTA, um, some JTA standalone connection pools, like uh, Bitronix or Atomicos. And it has a generic uh, adapter also for uh, Java E application servers. Now, the nice thing about it is that it allows you to start from, like for instance, from zero or from one, and it allows you to grow the connection pool size based on how much time you are willing to wait. Usually when you use a, a connection pool, it will uh, rapidly go to the maximum size without waiting, and you don't really want to do that. Uh, and also, Flexible gives you all sorts of uh, metrics, which uh, if you analyze, then uh, you can decide whether the current pool size is the right one or not. For instance, you can get the concurrent connection request. For, and in this graph, you can see why uh, taking only the average doesn't make uh, a lot of sense when you're uh, monitoring uh, performance. Usually, the average. Uh, the average just cuts all the outliers. So uh, if you take a look here, you'll see that on average, one, one connection is enough. But that's not true, because if you take on the 99 percentile, you will see that at least two connections are, uh, are needed. And sometimes uh, even between five and six might be uh, the right, uh, a very good uh, pool size for this uh, type of application we monitored here. Also, how the pool size is growing over time, you can uh, monitor. This one is how much time it took to acquire the connection when you take into consideration also retries or uh, whether the pool size uh, is growing after waiting for a given amount of time. And also, this is a, a very nice uh, metric because it gives you how much time a connection was borrowed from the pool. And uh, if you take a look there, you'll see that one transaction uh, took the, um, uh, was running for. 35 seconds, which is quite a lot, and that surely um, requires some investigation. Now, that was about monitoring connection. Another thing that you might want to do is to um, try to allay, uh, delay the connection acquisition as much as possible, because if you reduce the transaction uh, response time, you can execute a, a more transaction in a unit of time. Now. If you're using, based on what type of transaction you're using, either resource local or JTA, uh, you might the transaction might be acquired either immediately or as needed. Now, the reason why for uh, for resource local uh, connection uh, transactions, uh, the con the connection is fetched right away is because Hibernate uh, needs to get the auto commit mode and uh, probably set it if it's set to true, which is uh, usually the default for JDBC. However, if you are using Hikari or any other connection pool and you know for sure that uh, you set the auto commit mode, uh, the connection pool size, you don't really need to do that again in Hibernate. And that, uh, that's going to help you a lot. For instance, if, you have, if you're having a service method, something like that, which does uh, reads an XML, XML document also, it parses it, and then it uh, persists the, the entities uh, being read from, from that document. So in this case, if the transaction transaction is fetched right away, uh, you are going to uh, hold on to that connection even during the read and the parsing, which that actually makes no sense because you you acquire the connection way before actually really need it, uh, needing it. In this case, even the persist might not need it, and we can actually delay it until the transaction is needed to be. Um, 
commit it, and then we need to uh, flush the persistence context. So in this case, we introduce in Hibernate 5.2.10 this property, which uh, tells Hibernate that you already disable the auto commit mode. So it skips that check. So you can delay the connection acquisition until you really need to execute a statement or you need to flush the persistence context. And there is, are some pending actions. And as you can see here, the difference uh, can be quite significant. The more you have to wait and the more processing you have to do up front, uh, that's going to, to be the gap between immediately and as needed. Good, so that was about uh, connections. Now, one thing you can uh, optimize right from the start is choosing the right identifier generators. Um, in JPA, you can have identity sequence or table. Auto is just going to pick one or the other. Uh, identity, um, if you are using identity, uh, the only problem is that it's going to disable the JDBC batch inserts. Uh, that's not something that uh, uh, is wrong in the database, it's just how Hibernate schedules entities. So it needs to have the entity uh, identifier uh, known so that it can store it in the first level cache. And because of that, for identity, uh, the only way to know the identifier is if you execute a statement. Therefore, when the flush comes, the inserts were already generated, so uh, you don't have the chance to execute this, uh, the inserts in a batch. For MySQL, you don't really have any choice. That's the only choice uh, you have. For MariaDB, which uh, uh, emerges as a fork of MySQL, now in um, 10.3, they are going to introduce uh, support for sequences. Um, however, only uh, as at the moment of uh, speaking now, 10.2 is um, um, is an actual release. 10.3 is just um, in beta, I guess. For sequence, if the database, uh, if your database supports sequences, uh, this is a much better fit for Hibernate and. Uh, Nowadays, even SQL Server um, supports sequences beside Oracle and Postgres, which uh, uh, have been supported for quite a, lot, um, for, for quite a long time. Uh, because uh, for a sequence, you need to go with an extra round trip to the database to know the sequence. You can actually optimize that with various optimizers offered by Hibernate, which are not standardized in order to uh, if you're using an old Hibernate version, like for instance three or four, you might uh, you might want to activate with the following property. Uh, otherwise, for Hibernate five, this property is uh, set by default. Now, of course, if you're inserting fifty rows and you want to generate uh, and you generate fifty database round trips, that's going to take more than if you try to reduce that uh, to uh, ten five or even one uh, database round trip. So that's the goal of using the optimizers, just reducing the number of round trips you need in order to generate the sequence of values. Uh, you also have this table identifier generator, which looks good on paper, but in reality, when you think about how database systems work, you'll realize that uh, it's not very practical because it uses row level locks, and it also requires a separate connection in order to generate the to emulate the sequence value. And um, although it also, uh, it also uses uh, these optimizers, we will see that um, this uh, table identifier generator is not very uh, useful in reality. Um, of course, if you take a look, uh, if you use the optimizer, that's going to, you are going to see um, an improvement. However, on the, on the vertical scale, you can see that uh, previously we used to have milliseconds, now we have, um, now we have 1.5 or 2 milliseconds, and previously we used to have like 0 0.1 milliseconds. So if we compare how, for instance, the identity um, performs, how the identity generator performs uh, um, when you match it against table generator, you are going to obtain something like that. The more threads you are going to have, the more connections that you are going to have in your pool, the more you are going to see a bottleneck in the table um, in the table identifier generator because it puts pressure on the connection pool because it uh, needs uh, an extra connection and also the identifier generator the row level lock is going to become uh, is going to introduce a serialized uh, portion of execution 
And so what you are going to see here is uh, just uh, Amdahl's law in practice. Also, uh, why this is very important if you're using MySQL and MariaDB is that uh, prior to Hibernate 5, if you're using native, uh, Hibernate would choose identity. However, for auto now, uh, it picks a table instead of identity. So pay extra, be very uh, careful if you're using MySQL and MariaDB uh, with auto uh, identifier generators. Now for sequences, of course, if you right from the start, you can probably uh, um, have a feeling of how a sequence will perform against the table because the table tries to emulate uh, emulate the sequence and always if you have a native implementation usually it performs better than uh, the emulated version in this case it looks something like that you can actually barely see the sequence uh, how the sequence uh, the response time for the sequence but then the table is quite significant and the more thread you have the more uh, the, the worse is going to scale. On the other hand, the, um, the sequence generator scale, uh, scales quite uh, nicely. Okay, so that was about identifiers. Now we can go further. Um, another thing which is actually really important to performance is how various um, JPA relationships uh, work when you're using Hibernate. From the database perspective, it's quite simple. You only have three associations. You have one too many, which is um, just one foreign key. It, uh, it requires only one foreign key on the child table side. Uh, you can have one to one, which is actually one foreign key with a unique constraint, and many to many, which requires two foreign keys and an extra joint table in between two parent tables. Now, when it comes to JPA, you have uh, many combinations because you can have many to one, one to many. Those can be unidirectional or bidirectional. You can have uh, different collection types like set, list, maps. And um, so on the left side, you can see which are the most efficient ones, like many to one and the bidirectional one to many. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the unidirectional one to many from a database perspective is not very efficient. And the least efficient uh, is when you're using bags or uh, one to many unidirectional one to many lists. For the one to one, the best one is uh, when you're using maps ID because you can share the primary key and the foreign key can be only can be just one column, so you don't need two indexes for that. And uh, for the parent side, the mapped by is not very efficient unless you are using bytecode enhancement. For many to many, only the set. Uh, performs uh, actually quite well, on, uh, but the list uh, does not. It's just the same with unidirectional uh, with unidirectional lists. Um, somehow a little bit better would be if you're using an order column, but it's just uh, a, a slight improvement. Uh, if you don't want to use a set and really want to use a list, then it's better to just map the intermediary joint table as an entity and then turn the association, the many to many association into two uh, one um, bidirectional one to many uh, associations, which is actually what uh, happens uh, when you're using a database uh, anyway, a many to many database uh, relationship uh, anyway. So yeah, keep that in mind. Uh, always pick um, associations which uh, are simple, stay away from very complex or exotic association because Usually, the simple, uh, the simpler the simpler the association, the better the performance. All right, now batching. Batching uh, allows you to reduce the number of round trips, just like uh, we've seen uh, we we have seen for for uh, the sequence optimizers. It's actually the same uh, principle. Instead of going uh, over and over for every statement, you can actually uh, squash multiple parameters and send them all at once uh, for the uh, for the same statement now hibernate unlike other jdbc uh, unlike other unlike plain jdbc or other frameworks which don't have an automatic statement generator uh, hibernate allows you to switch from non batching to batching with just uh, uh, some configuration you don't need to rewrite your application you can do that with a session factory application which applies to every session 
or you can even overwrite that specific setting, that global setting on a per session uh, level. The, the session factory uh, configuration looks like this. You just uh, give uh, a batch size and then every session will inherit and you are going to use uh, batching by default. Uh, you can also override. We, ha we had this uh, addition uh, in Hibernate API from Hibernate uh, 5.2. And uh, of course, you can, uh, if you're using the JPA um, API, then you need to unwrap the entity manager to the Hibernate session in order to get access to, to this um, API. So if you're executing, uh, in this case, 10, if you're uh, persisting 10 person entities, you can see from the query size that only one uh, statement was executed. And then you had a batch size of 10 and all the um, all those 10 uh, um, person related uh, batch um, bind variable were squashed together and sent in only one database around three. That's uh, this log output was taken uh, using data source proxy, which I mentioned before. And uh, it's not only that uh, it allows you to see the bind parameter values because Hibernate can do that as well, but you can actually uh, see that uh, you are using batching or not. And that's uh, really, that's quite um, very good. It, it's very nice to, to, to use this data source proxy. So, uh, once you set that configuration, batch size is going to work for inserts, update, and delete statements as well. On the leftmost side, you can see that's the default if you don't use uh, any batching. And when you ins when you are inserting five thousand rows, you can see that even a small, even a, a relatively small batch size of ten is going to buy you a lot because instead of doing five thousand statements, you're actually going to to execute only 500, so you are you are saving 90 percent. Of course, if you're if you're pushing increasing the batch size, you are not going to see uh, a lot of gain because uh, uh, from 10 to 100, you reduce the batch size, you reduce the number of rounds uh, from 500 to to 50. So it's just 450, which is much less than uh, 4,500, which we had uh, when we switched from one to 10. So it works just the same for update and also for uh, delete statements. So it's quite an easy game. You just set it, and uh, if you're doing a lot of writes and uh, lots of update inserts and delete, then um, you can benefit. It's, it's quite an easy game. Uh, if you're using cascading, uh, you might want to set those uh, properties as well. Otherwise, uh, Hibernate is going to disable batching every time it tries it, it switches from the parent to to a child because uh, during when you are in a connection, you can only execute one statement at a time. And um, if you are, uh, if you have a batch, you can you cannot switch to another statement uh, unless you flush the flush the current batch, and then you can start over with uh, with the next the next one. That's why you need to order insert and updates. Unfortunately, there's no uh, settings for delete, but well, there are some workarounds. Uh, which you can uh, use. Also, uh, if you're using uh, old versions of Hibernate, like four or three, also if you're using old versions of uh, the Oracle driver and the dialect, like eight, nine, and 10, uh, you might uh, pay attention to this property. By default in Hibernate 5, it's activated. However, on older version of Hibernate, whenever you had the um, whenever you enable optimistic locking on an entity that would disable batching, so um, uh, you don't really want to have that because uh, this property was set uh, as a consequence of some old drivers which didn't support all, uh, in the same time batching and optimistic locking. Now things have changed. Uh, even the Oracle 12 driver works quite nicely with uh, this combination. So. Uh, you only need to disable it for very old uh, drivers. And uh, what's even if you're using Hyper, uh, Oracle 10 on, or 11 in production, you can still use the Oracle 12 driver because it's uh, both backward and forward compatible. So once they fix an issue, you can actually benefit from a newer version of the driver, even if you're using uh, an older version of Oracle. Okay, so now fetching. 
fetching is quite uh, one of the I, I would say that it's the number one problem when it comes to performance issues, because especially when you're using uh, tools like JPA and Hibernate, it's very easy to, to fetch more data than you really need. And there are several things uh, you need to consider when it comes to fetching, like the fetch size, the result set size, also what are you fetching DTOs or entities, and how many associations you are going to fetch as well. The first thing is the fetch size, which in JDBC terms, uh, it tells you how many round trips are needed to, to extract the result set and to push all the data from the server, from the database server into the client, which is the JDBC um, driver. So you, when you get the result set, if uh, you consume the whole result set, then uh, that's where the fetch size is going to be used. Uh, by default, on Postgres and MySQL, you don't uh, have to set the fetch size because the whole result set is going to be fetched at once. And if you're using Hibernate, that's actually uh, the way to go because Hibernate is going to navigate and uh, return a list of either uh, DTOs, an object array, or entities. So that's the right uh, setting for when you're using Hibernate. And for SQL Server, it's the same. It uses some adaptive buffering, so we don't really need to, to change or provide a specific fetch size. The only database where you might want to set this is Oracle, because in Oracle, the default fetch size is just 10. If you, even if you're selecting 100, uh, if you have a result set of 100 entries, that would require 10 round trips. And uh, you, you, you might want to speed that up and uh, for, for this purpose. Hibernate offers this configuration property, which once you set it, is going to uh, be applied to every session, so you don't uh, you don't have to worry about it anymore. And you can even um, override the global uh, setting using this uh, JPA query hint if you want. Okay, so if you look at this graph, uh, it tells you what the how much it how much time it takes to uh, materialize the result set to to, uh, to grab all the data in the client side result set when you vary the, the fetch size from 1 to 10,000. And you can see if you put uh, uh, just, if you're using a fetch size of 1, that would require 10,000 round trips. And that takes a lot of time. And even between 10 and 100, you can see quite a significant gain. So that's where, for instance, uh, that's uh, why you might want to, to increase that value if you're using uh, for instance or now uh, the number of round trips uh, might be a problem but usually you don't really want to have 10,000 results set usually you want to to use a much uh, a limited result set and you don't want you want to use pagination because otherwise think about it if you're selecting 10,000 results uh, you cannot even display them on on the on a browser or for a mobile client if you're not even using wi-fi maybe you are using the the gps uh, data packet connection so in that case actually it's going to cost you more money to to uh, uh to fetch more data from uh, from from a server so you don't want to do that even for batch pro batch processing task it's much uh, easier to use smaller transactions and operate with smaller batch size and probably parallelize tasks. So usually you want to paginate. And what's nice about the JPA API, which is allows you to set the, the offset and the maximum results, is that these two methods apply also to entity queries like JPQL or Criteria API, but also they work just fine uh, even for native SQL queries. And Hibernate is going to uh, supply the right syntax based on uh, your current database. So when you're fetching uh, 100,000 rows versus 100 rows, you can see quite a significant impact. And you might think that you might not even select 100,000 rows, but if you develop now the application and you leave it into production, data tends to grow. And one query, which today only uh, selects 100 or 1,000 rows in one or two years, uh, if you don't use pagination, it might uh, select 100,000 records instead. And uh, uh, 
uh, you want to get this right right from the very beginning because otherwise the performance of the application will degrade with uh, once the da data keeps on while well, the data keeps on increasing. So yes, uh, when it comes to pagination, you can use those JPA. You can use the JPA API. Um, the only caveat is that um, it uses the standard offset pagination, which is defined by the SQL standard, and that only scales if you have a if you have a reasonable or a reasonable set size, or if you scan over a reasonable uh, reasonable um, uh, data set. If you want, if you need to scan like large resources, like millions of records, then you should use uh, key set pagination, because uh, otherwise, if you're using offset, it just uh, um, traverses, for instance, an index and then uh, scans the data and then just discards it, and uh, that will take uh, quite quite some time. You can use this uh, uh, this reference on use the index loop, which is uh, Marcus Vinant's site. Uh, he also wrote SQL performance explained, and uh, there he he tells you more about why piece and pagination is much uh, better fit uh, if you have a very large uh, result set, or if you really want to um, uh, secure the order of pay of uh, the pages that you read, because otherwise, if you insert in the middle, the pages uh, might shift in case of offset. Okay, so. That was about uh, the size, the number of rows. You can reduce not just the rows, you can also reduce the result set uh, when it comes to the number of columns. And uh, the difference between the first query, which selects all the columns, uh, not only the columns from the post common, but also all the columns from all the join tables here, like post or post details. So if we have like five columns in post, uh, five in post and uh, five in post details, Reality are going to select 15. And uh, the difference between the first one and one DTO projection, which only selects the columns that you really need, uh, can be visualized in this graph. For uh, you can see it's quite it takes quite a lot of time to fetch more data. And a, a great benefit of um, using DTO projection is that if you have very, very large result set and uh, very specific queries, you might uh, use covering uh, indexes and then you don't even need to scan data pages anymore because you can uh, return the whole result set and uh, satisfy the query just with the index data alone. Okay, so the DTO projections are very good for read-only views when you want to read data and uh, you don't really need to modify it. Like for instance, when you want to display trees, tables or graphs or doing analytics, building reports, that's that's when you need to use DTO projection. And you can do that both with JPQL and entity queries or with uh, native SQL queries. On the other hand, entities are needed. You only need to use JPQL and fetch entities if you plan on modifying those entities either in that transaction or a subsequent one in case you're using web flows. The benefit is that for writing, it provides you application level repeatable reads, and you can even overcome uh, phenomena like read, write skew, and lost updates across multiple uh, uh, multiple requests when your webflow is actually one logical uh, transaction. Uh, the last thing about uh, about fetching is uh, you have to really pay a lot of attention to to the way uh, association are fetched. One to many and many to many are fetched lazily, and many to one and one to one are fetched eagerly, and that's quite bad because if you forget if you're using the default and you're using a JPQL query which forgets to fetch also the to one association, you are going to end up with an M plus one query issue. So, if you the, it's better to default to fetch type lazy for all associations, and then only for every business use case you have the right context and the right information which tells you how much data you need to fetch and then everything that you uh, if you have association that you need to fetch eagerly you need to decide that at the query level using either uh, joint fetch directive which is available in jpql and criteria api or entity graphs fetch profiles and um, the only thing that you need to uh, pay attention 
when you're using lazy is the lazy initialization exception. The best way to deal with it is either to use DTO projections if you really need them or if you really want entities, then just uh, uh, make sure that you fetched all the associations that you further need uh, during wh while the persistence contest will open. There are also bad ways of uh, addressing the lazy initialization exception, like this open session in view, which some call it a pattern, which in fact, in re and in reality, is just an empty pattern. Why do you really care about this? Is that if you're using Spring Boot, that's enabled by default. You don't have to, you actually have to disable it if you're using Spring Boot. So if you're using Spring Boot, that's, uh, that's uh, it applies. Uh, the reason why um, open session in view, it's a problem is that Hibernate, uh, here you're opening the session in a web filter and the, the, the connection is acquired, the connection is always related to the transaction and it is acquired in the, uh, in the service layer and then you fetch several posts during one transaction and possibly doing other operations as, as well. And if, we, if you forget to uh, initialize some lazy association, the session is still open and during the rendering, uh, then you are going to initialize them, but then you don't have any transaction anymore. So and every association is going to require a new transaction and a new connection. So you put pressure both on the transaction manager in the database and also on the connection pool level. And then it's much more difficult to figure it out and to control and decide uh, where and how much a transaction took because for, for this part during the rendering of the view, you are going to work in auto commit mode. And that's uh, quite bad uh, from a performance uh, perspective. Even worse than this is this temporary session anti pattern, which uh, you can uh, activate with only one configuration property. Don't do that. Uh, what you are going to get instead is Hibernate is going to work just like Eclipse Link. In Eclipse Link, you don't have lazy initialization exception, but it works just like that. So it just opens uh, a new session, which also requires a new connection and which will work in auto commit for every uh, um, lazily fetched uh, association. So yeah, don't just because uh, it's very convenient uh, does not mean that uh, you really need to use it. The last thing on our agenda is caching. For caching, uh, some people that use uh, Hibernate, uh, uh, whenever they have some performance issues, they just uh, rush into introducing the second level cache. However, before jumping to second level cache, you have to acknowledge that there are already multiple caching layers that uh, you might already use. Like for instance, even if you don't use an application uh, level cache, you already benefit from operating system cache the database was designed to work as much as possible in memory, so it has this shared buffer or a buffer pool, which you can configure so that you can hold. Uh, if you have enough RAM, you can even hold all the data if uh, you don't have uh, uh, terabytes of data. Otherwise, if you have a very large result set, you can at least hold in, uh, in the shared buffer the, the working set and the most used indexes. Um, the balance and the trade-off between an application level cache and uh, uh, the database cache is, is that the closer you are to the database, the more easy, the easier it is to have consistency, but then uh, you, get, you don't get uh, the same performance which you get if you bypass multiple layers, which is the case of application level caches. Now, the second level cache is somewhere in between those, and we will see where uh, it's appropriate to use. If you consider the same diagram we saw previously, you will see that actually scaling the read throughput is very easy. You can just spawn uh, extra replica nodes. So scaling reads is not very difficult. Uh, that's why you don't always, you don't need to use the second level cache for uh, to speed up reads. However, the second level cache is very useful to to reduce the load on the master node because when you are executing read write transaction, you always have to go to the master node. And scaling write is much more difficult. Uh, usually you can only do it with scaling vertically. And if that does not work, you will have to shard and split the, the master and use multiple uh, masters in individual shards. Now, 
as you know from this uh, very famous quote, uh, cache invalidation and naming things are very difficult stuff. And uh, in this case, the second level cache helps you with the first one, which is uh, the invalidating the cache. And uh, now uh, in Hibernate, you have multiple um, strategies which you can use. Uh, read, write, and transactional are useful because they provide you strict consistency. They work in write through mode. And transactional uses JTA. Uh, of course, it, you pay a penalty for, for using the two phase commit protocol. Uh, but if you have a, a very high write, uh, uh, write intensive application, that actually might help. Um, if you don't want to use JTA, you can use uh, read write, which uses soft level locks and scales better. And if you that uh, these two only work if you have only one node in the second level cache implementation. If you want to use a distributed uh, distributed cache, you cannot use locks because using lock in a locks in a distributed system is quite a bad idea. And in that case, you need to use a read uh, non strict read write, which has a very tiny window of uh, inconsistency where uh, you might get inconsistent results. However, getting um, stale data is um, not as bad as uh, writing stale data. So usually you can cope uh, with that using optimistic law. So now the last thing on our uh, on this presentation is for the second level cache, because you can cache entities and also collection, you can actually have something like that and store an entire aggregate uh, and cache it in the second level cache and bypass the database entirely. You could do the same. Uh, in, with an application level cache, but then if you re, uh, if you rename one tag and then you have 100 entries uh, which uh, use that specific tag, then you would have to either invalidate or update one by one all those entries. In this case, that's uh, not uh, going to happen because uh, you uh, the second level cache uses multiple regions, and if you rename one tag, it's just one entry in one region. So it, uh, for the writing part, it scales better. It scales the writes better because it, uh, it distributes uh, the individual writes across multiple regions. And you can actually fetch the whole aggregate without going to the data. And that's all I've had to present to you. We've discussed all of those. If you want more, you can find, uh, of course, in my book, uh, they are very well detailed. And there are also things about JDBC and um, and Juke, which uh, when you use them together, you can actually resolve most of the problems that you might have uh, when you want to speed up an enterprise. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd very much recommend following <laughs> Vlad and Lucas on Twitter for some, uh, some extremely yeah. interesting and funny uh, discussions as well. A um, couple of questions in from, uh, sorry, Vlad, were you going to respond? Uh, yeah, I wanted to say that, that following Vlad and Lucas is a good combo. <laughs> yeah, it is a good combo. It's uh, definitely well worth the entertainment factor. Um, OK, so we have a couple of questions in. Uh, we have a question from uh, Oleg, actually. Oleg actually asked a very leading question which uh, yeah. about, about monitoring, which we can ask maybe a little bit later. But I'll ask some other reasonable ones first. Um, <laughs> first one was uh, about whether your slides will be available after. Presumably, if you have these up already, I, we can send them around uh, to, sure. to the list. Sure, I can send them to you, and then you can broadcast them I, either way you want. We can store them on SlideShare, or if you want, you can or you can store them on uh, on a virtual Juke site if you have. Uh, so if you if you if you put them on SlideShare and then we can share that URL around, that would be perfect. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to give you a link uh, to to Excellent. actually you can already find them there, but I'm going to send you the link. Perfect, thank you. Uh, another one from uh, Krista Panoa. Uh, are there any performance strategies specific to embedded databases? For Im yes, for embedded databases, probably you might want to store everything uh, to make sure that all the data fits in memory so that you bypass the, the the disk as much as possible because usually that's what that's usually the bottleneck when you have lots of data and also concurrency it's going to be it's going to be the disk if you have increased concurrency of course 
you don't have many options, but uh, but using multiple uh, cores and making sure that your embedded database was designed in such a way to benefit from that. Because if I remember correctly, like for instance, when it, it was the case for 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 MySQL, all versions of MySQL, like MySQL 5.1, and uh, which could not benefit from more than 24 CPUs. And so yeah, you have to think about that. Even uh, even the database needs to be designed in such a way to benefit from from uh, providing uh, more power to it. But usually, okay. yeah, yeah, that's what uh, you can do. Awesome. Uh, another question from uh, Zishan. Uh, how do you set the fetch size for big lazy collections? Uh, setting the fetch size, yeah, using uh, using lazy collection. That's very uh, it's a very bad idea. You don't want to do that. Actually, that's um, when, whenever I see that, it's a code smell that something goes wrong there because uh, you know we call it one too many uh, the association, but that's bad because usually you uh, what you want to you only want to use it for one too few child. If you have like one million records, you don't want to you don't really want to use a a, a collection, and you don't really need to use a collection because uh, if you think about how databases work, you only have the foreign key. And then you execute a query, and during at the query time you you limit it. So that's exactly what you need to do. You just remove the collection entirely, and you just use queries instead. And you have the association because you have the many to one side. Just uh, it was one one post which was written like eleven years ago by by uh, the co-author of uh, Java Perform uh, Java Persistence with uh, with Hibernate uh, Christian Bauer, and he said. Just because you have collection, you don't really, you don't necessarily have to use them for every task. Sometimes a query is just the the, the best tool for, uh -huh. and you can better limit it. You awesome. use it. Uh, Oleg, uh, you had a question. Yeah, I was uh, interested in the in the distributed caches, and mm -hmm. uh, when would you recommend? Like, imagine. Uh, I'm growing, I have a small app and maybe a cluster of things, like a, a couple of servers, not the giant, uh, like thousand. And like, would you recommend starting with the distributed cache for Hibernate immediately, or should I do like local second level caches, or should I not do second level caches at all? Can you well, yeah, that's a very good question, Oleg. Uh, the first thing I would do always is not jump to the second level cache. The first thing you need to do is just make sure that the uh, the database is set, the buffer pool is set properly, that you don't do double caching like you have the buffer pool in Oracle and MySQL, and then the Linux is going to cache the same pages twice, so you need to, to bypass and do direct I.O. So that's the first thing you, you really need to do, and make sure that the settings are uh, are are, um, are everything is properly set and you can benefit, you can monitor and see, and you can get a lot of performance because the moment when you you skip the disk, even the SSD is like uh, 10,000 times slower than accessing data in memory. If you can, if you, if you can fit uh, all, all the database in memory, and that's exactly what, uh, what they do, for instance, for Stack Overflow, they only have two nodes, just, just two nodes. And uh, they just have, they have like a several 300, uh, more than 300 gigabytes of RAM on SQL Server, and they can fit, they compressed all the data in such a way that it just fits there. And of course, they also use Redis uh, for, uh, for caching. So yeah, if you're using, the, the second thing that I would do is probably use an application level cache. You want to use that because it allows you to, it, it allows you to, to just, uh, Disconnect the database and still working. If you cache double, if you cache all the data also in the, you have all the data duplicated in the cache. It allows you to to just have the read availability when the database is down. It can be down because you need to upgrade it, or it can be down because of some failures, or or for instance, I, I don't know, maybe you have been uh, hacked and uh, uh, something went terribly wrong, or someone just uh, executed a statement and. Uh, um, now the database doesn't uh, respond uh, anymore, so you need to restore from backups. So using this uh, application level cache, it allows you to level up traffic spikes. If someone attacks your application and you see an increase in traffic spike, if 
the traffic goes to the cache and because because it's 0 by 1 uh, you won't uh, get the impact is not going to be that uh, high so, uh, to uh, to just uh, ban that uh, IPs or something like that. Otherwise, if you just send all the traffic, the traffic spike to the database, chances are the, that the database will not cope and will just uh, will be broken. Will just uh, stop stop responding. So if the database stops responding, you have zero availability. But if you duplicate all the data in the in an application level cache, at least you have write. Uh, you can read from the application, but you cannot uh, write to it. Because that's not this, that's not the authoritative way of storing data, and uh, the second level cache is just uh, I would only use it for for making sure when when I when I cannot uh, scale or to help scaling the writes on the master node, and I would probably uh, go with because you only have one master node, and I would probably go to first for and if you don't have a lot of front end nodes. I would go with uh, with just uh, simple, not not distributed uh, second level cache, and probably only use the distributed level cache if uh, I can um, if if that that doesn't work or if nodes uh, if I use auto scaling nodes tend to to be destroyed and then spawn again. In which case, uh, you, when you spawn a new node, you just have a cold cache and everything goes to the server. So in that case, for clouds, for instance, that might might actually make made a lot of sense. Otherwise, if you have dedicated resources and uh, just having one server uh, dying from time to time, probably that not really that much, uh, very, that much of a big deal, you know? Cool, cool. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Awesome. Uh, is there any more questions? So, uh, so I think we're good at that. Oh, so, thank you very, very much, Vlad, uh, for uh, for giving us the session today. Great insight into uh, into how to improve the performance of, uh, of your Hibernate um, usage. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. It absolutely, is our pleasure. And uh, the next session we have is on July sometime. Let me see. It's uh, I can tell you actually, July is going to be a Java nine month. Uh, while others slip to September, we we remain strong in July. Uh, we are uh, we have two sessions on Java nine in in July. July twelfth is Simon Ritter fifty five new features in JDK nine, and uh, on July twenty fifth um, we have Nikolai who is going to be giving us a session on uh, migration. So this is to Jar Hell and back a live migration to the Java 9 module system. So do make sure you uh, attend them as well. One last thing I'll say before we before we go is that we also have VJUG24, which is going to be on the 25th of October. The CFP for that is uh, is closing just this Friday. So if you're interested in that, go to papercall, uh, what is it, papercall.org? Dot .io. Papercall.io. Uh, forward slash vjog24 and feel free to uh, to submit any sessions there and we'll be uh, we'll be reviewing them over the next few weeks um i don't think i have anything else so yeah thank you very much again vlad for joining us sure, my um, pleasure. it was a great first session i'm sure we'll have more from you in the future yeah uh, I hope you feel better soon oh actually one 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 thing we can announce is we asked i asked uh, josh block on Twitter just recently to see if he would give us another session on um, Effective Java, which he's actually going to be releasing, what is it, edition three now? The book, the, yeah. yeah, or four. Or third or fourth. Could, could uh, be Effective Java 9. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's effectively, it's effectively uh, Effective Java on, it's going to be JDK 8. Um, so we're going to look at, uh, you know, what Josh is going to be talking about. It's going to be realistic examples and, and best practices about how you can use uh, Java 8. Uh, so look forward to that. We'll be we'll be posting that. I think the book is due to come out around October, so sometime after that we'll be posting that. Uh, so thanks, Vlad. Thanks, Oleg. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending, and uh, see you all next time. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.